glad that you all joined our seminar. Today we have a special guest that is going to talk about, I would say, not mainstream research that we used to. We have the honor to have uh, Jerry Pollack with us from the University of Washington. He's been working for the past, I would say, 15 or 20 years on the fourth phase of water. Yep. And he's published a book about it, The Fourth Phase of Water, in which the big chunk of his work is summarized. And he's going to show us what is the fourth phase of water, and he's going to talk about it. And I hope we're all going to have good questions and we learn something from it. So thank you very much, Jerry, and please. Uh, Shekha, thank you uh, for the introduction. Uh, OK, so, so I want to talk about this. Uh, uh, shall we say unusual uh, phase, but this is not a laboratory curiosity as a, a show, it's all over the place. And um, I'm gonna to touch on the uh, central role in health and agriculture. And one of the main points that, uh, whoops, uh, uh, why is this? Uh, yeah, is uh, light. Uh, this is uh, something you perhaps didn't expect, but light plays a big role in everything that I'm going to be talking about. So the first question is, uh, do we really understand uh, water? Uh, you'd think that we understand water, of course, because uh, it's the simplest substance and it's been studied by so many people. But I'm going to demonstrate to you that uh, you really don't understand water. I, I start with that. I'll give you a few examples. Uh, uh, and, and I challenge you um, uh, to figure out what's going on. So here's a cloud, right? Cloud consists of water. Uh, water, if you were to uh, take a ladder and climb up to the level of the cloud and took a pitcher of water and pour it, it would go right down. Uh, so my question to you is, uh, why do clouds float? I don't expect an answer because otherwise I won't get to the end. But if you don't know the answer, then you don't know about water. Um, uh, probably never thought about that. And here's another example. These are two beakers sitting next to each other filled with water. Uh, you stick one electrode in here, one electrode in here, turn on the high voltage, and here's what happens. Um, um, you get a bridge between the two. And if you were to move one beaker away from the other, the bridge uh, extends for up to four centimeters and indefinitely. Uh, please explain this. What's going on? This is water. That's all. How do you explain it? Okay, another one. This is a, a, a lizard from Central America, and it spends most of its time leisurely on the branch. Uh, and uh, when it gets the urge, nobody knows what the urge is, it jumps from the branch and, um, and it walks on water. And so uh, because it walks on water, it's uh, often called the Jesus Christ lizard. Uh, how does it walk on the water? Uh, and here's my favorite. Uh, this is a, a trough filled with water. This is a Middle Eastern image, uh, uh, filled with water. Um, and uh, some red dye is put in for effect. You'll see why in a moment. And this is a, a magnet, um, a superconducting magnet. When the magnet's turned on, the Red Sea splits so that Moshe could walk across it. Uh, so this is real, real observation. It's not a, not a trick uh, um, from a professor at, at Tokyo, University of Tokyo. Uh, and if you can't explain it, uh, then you don't know all there is to know about water. So I was teasing you a bit. Um, I got my inspiration from this guy, Gilbert Ling. He came uh, in the first cohort of Chinese students to come study at the US. Uh, throughout all of China, they picked three, one of them, uh, Yang got the Nobel Prize, and they all thought he was the smartest, uh, Ling. And unfortunately, he passed just before reaching 100 years old. And he uh, collected lots of evidence that inside the cell that the water was not like um, water in this cup. Um, the water actually, the water molecules were organized in, in a certain way. They kind of stack on one another like dipoles would, 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 would stack. And he was a controversial guy, and he wrote many books on the subject, and um, uh, he influenced me greatly. And I decided that since Gilbert Ling was not a good writer um, of books, I, I decided to help him um, in some way to write my own book that described his ideas. And I went on uh, a bit 
beyond, but basically I, I wrote this book, 2001, Sales, Gels, and the Engines of Life. It's got a nice picture, nice cover. Um, but uh, the book received mixed reviews. Uh, uh, some uh, were, were um, um, really enthusiastic. One guy said uh, uh, from Harvard University, this is a 305 uh, page preface to the future of cell biology. Uh, and uh, others said, this is the biggest nonsense that I've ever heard. Uh, so controversial, but the discerning people uh, always pick out this book, as you can see in the slide. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> and they go on to read it without, without stopping. And so um, it's popular among, uh, among some, some people. So what is the idea, at least Gilbert Ling's ideas? Uh, and that is inside the cell, you've got many solids that mostly proteins and the protein surfaces tend to be charged uh, throughout most of their surface, hydrophilic. And the water molecules here are shown as dipoles, so plus minus and so on. And it's logical to think that some of these may actually stick uh, on to the surface because they're right next to these charges. And most physical chemists will uh, agree that there may be one or two uh, molecular layers uh, 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 of these ordered water molecules, but not beyond because of thermal or Brownian motion. Uh, and uh, Gilbert Lane said, no, not true. Uh, he said, there are many, many layers, maybe dozens, if not hundreds. And I'm gonna show you uh, in a moment that there are actually more, can be more than just hundreds, uh, many more. Um, and I will show you also that, that, uh, that this structure is not necessarily correct. Um, we'll go into that. So we were looking, uh, having published the book, we we're looking for some, some way of doing experiments because this is fascinating. How could you not do experiments on this? And, uh, and, and so if this is a, a kind of ordered crystalline-like structure. Crystals tend to exclude particles and solutes. So we were looking for an experimental model where uh, particles at first, uh, later solutes, where particles were excluded. And we found it. Uh, we found it rather quickly thanks to some serendipitous uh, uh, events that occurred. So this is a chamber uh, here, uh, and we put a gel in the chamber. These are uh, hydrogels, water-based gels. And we put water and particles. These particles are little spheres, microspheres that we put in. And we looked in the microscope and immediately we saw that there was a zone here that contained no, uh, none of these spheres. And we thought maybe, possibly, this could be a region uh, um, uh, in which the, uh, the water molecules were organized and therefore they would uh, uh, push out these microspheres. This is a 10 micrometer scale. Actually, um, if you look at the video, it's, it's a bit more, more dramatic. Sorry about that. This is one of our first <laughs> um, um, attempts. Um, and, and you can see that there's a zone that seems to be growing and pushing out these microspheres. It was stopped artificially. But uh, here, roughly 50 micrometers. So, so we were intrigued because we thought maybe, we had no evidence at the time, but maybe this is a region uh, where where the, the water is ordered in some way, but this will be a rather large 50 micrometer region containing uh, numerous um, uh, water molecules. So someone suggested we give it a name because you, instead of just describing it in so many words, you can call it something. And uh, my, it, my Australian friend said, well, why don't you call it exclusion zone? Um, and then, because it excludes, uh, and then EZ, in Israel it's EZ, I guess, uh, but, at some places in the US, it's easy and it's easy to remember, easy water. So we call it, I call this easy water. Uh, later, we began calling it fourth phase water because that made more sense. So in terms of generality, I, I, I haven't shown you uh, a lot of evidence because um, um, of the time issue, but um, we have uh, many observations, many papers on, on this. And uh, the conclusion we reached is that many, not all, many hydrophilic surfaces generate exclusion zones and many solutes are excluded uh, uh, from this. Um, including, um, I know there's interest in, in, in plants and such. And um, uh, here is an, an uh, example from, uh, I'm not sure if you know the late Martin Canny, he sent me this. Does He did a lot of, 
uh, electron microscopy. And this is a, a xylem, I can't remember the species, but he demonstrated uh, that um, right near the edge that these little particles or spheres that he used are excluded. So there are exclusion zones, um, not only in, in uh, many hydrophilic substances, but also in the xylem of plants, um, or at least some anyway. Um, so next question is, is this water really different from ordinary uh, bulk water? Is there something going on that's different? And uh, this is evidence that easy water is physically different from bulk water. Now, uh, uh, essentially all of this is published. Uh, and so I'm not gonna go over it, but here are, here are eight different, you can sort of scan, scan through. I just don't wanna use up my time. Um, uh, for all of this. This was 10 years ago. And since then, we have at least four or five um, uh, different um, um, observations about how this kind of water differs uh, from, uh, from uh, distilled water, or ordinary water. And I, I do want to talk about this one, um, because, you know, H2O is, is neutral. Um, but we found that EZ has negative charges by sticking two electrodes in, microelectrodes, one in the exclusion zone and one outside, and uh, electrical potential of something like uh, between 100 and 200 millivolts uh, negative. Um, and that, that's all published. And, um, and so basically what you have is something that looks like this. This is kind of summarizing. Uh, you have a, a kind of hydrophilic surface sitting next to water initially. And what happens is that this uh, easy water exclusion zone, as you saw on, this, on the video, builds up and it's got a negative charge and, um, and positive charge here. And the way that happens, uh, as, as best we know, is that the individual water molecules, which originally sat here, uh, energy comes in and the energy splits the water molecule uh, into a negative part, um, here and a positive part. And this negative part uh, builds uh, next to the hydrophilic surface, giving you the negatively charged EZ. And meanwhile, the positive charges, the hydrogens are cast out into the bulk water uh, sitting here. So basically you've got a battery uh, that, that builds. And, and the structure that we deduced, um, um, it looks something like this. And I, I'm not going to, again to go into all the steps that went to deduce this. If anybody's interested, the uh, for, book called Fourth Phase uh, goes into this in, in, in great detail. So, so the material, the hydrophilic material is first sitting next to water. And from the water, these layers build. And these are hexagonal sheet layers, a little bit like ice, but not, not ice. And they build one by one. So you would see you've got four of them and another one and another one and so on. And they keep building from this water. And if you were to look at, uh, at the surface of uh, one of these, looks like this. And as you know, uh, hexagonal motifs are very common in, in uh, nature. So you've got the oxygens here and the hydrogens here. Um, and um, if you were to um, do a, a, a count of one unit cell, you'd find that it's not H2O. If you did the count in one of these, it actually, uh, and you wouldn't expect it to be H2O because it's got to have negative charge. So it can't be H2O. And what we found is H3O2. If you had H4O2, it would be twice this, it would be neutral, but this one is negatively charged, which the experimental evidence dictates. So um, if we think about inside a cell, it could be animal cell, plant, plant cell, um, it, it, it doesn't matter, but uh, it basically uh, this is actually so crowded, uh, this grossly underestimates the crowd. And if you've got easy water um, surrounding this, you've got negative charge. And basically, basically the cell is filled with negatively charged easy uh, water. And if you were to stick an electrode in, you'd measure a, a net negative charge. The, the conventional reason for the negative charge has to do with membrane pumps and channels. But um, there are arguments uh, against that interpretation. I don't want to go into that. The very simple interpretation is it's the water. Um, so um, I'd like to touch on a subject just for a couple of minutes that I know is uh, 
sounding weird and controversial, but you know, I organize the annual conference uh, on, on the chemistry and physics of water each year. We're in our 15th year. And a lot of people are talking now at this conference, they come and talk about information that could be stored in water. And I, I present this at some risk because I know this is not at all mainstream. But think about for a moment, let me present it this way. Think about your thumb drive, what's inside, um, what stores information. Well, you've got transistors uh, that exist and they're arrayed in three dimensions. And there are, there are two characteristics of these that uh, confer uh, memory storage uh, to it. The first is, is that these are arrayed in the regular, uh, um, regularly arrayed disposition. And the second is that each one of these has two states. Uh, the transistor could be on, uh, off, zero, one, et cetera, and thereby you get memory. And so we ask the question, what about easy water? Is it possible uh, that it has some of the same characteristics? So this is the model that we've come up with easy, easy water. And um, so it needs to, in order to store information, it needs two characteristics. One is that um, the oxygen and the hydrogens need to be regularly arrayed, and they are. And the second is that they need to have at least two states. And I don't know that the hydrogens have two states, but it's um, textbook material that the oxygens have um, not two, but actually five different oxidation states. Minus two is the one we know typically, but also minus one, zero, plus one, plus two. And you'll find this, um, this is not exotic. This is in standard uh, chemistry textbooks. So if you, um, if you do the arithmetic, um, it, it turns out that the potential information density here because of the five different states is, something like uh, 10 to the eighth or 10 to the seventh, I forget the number, times what exists today in silicon. And so, um, of course, we don't know yet exactly how to get the information in and get the information out. Uh, the person who's most famous for doing this is the late Masara Emoto, who is not a scientist, he was a spiritualist. And uh, very few scientists I know take his work seriously. And the reason for that is a good reason because because he cherry picked his data. He picked the best crystals uh, rather than the, the typical one. Um, and this is just a representative. So if he played to the water, a symphony of Mozart, uh, and then he froze the water and he looked at the crystals after freezing it, this is a representative crystal. John Lennon, uh, imagine, uh, peace. He would either think or say peace or thank you. And uh, on the other hand, you fool. <laughs> or heavy metal music it gave these ugly crystals. So as I said, this is not accepted by, uh, the very few scientists are willing to take this very seriously. But I gotta tell you that people like Luc Montagnier have gotten interested. He won the Nobel prize. Uh, he comes to our conference every year dealing with information and memory in water, including information in the water that's in our body. And if anybody's interested, please, uh, look them up. He's a serious scientist. He got the Nobel Prize for his identifying HIV. Um, another point that's closely related to this is something that you probably never thought of is that the easy water can actually be solidified at room temperature. This is room temperature, solid water, right? <laughs> uh, amazing, at least for me, it's amazing. Um, and the guy who found it is uh, from Naples, Vittorio Elia, and he's published a few papers on it. And um, you don't get much of a yield. This is um, uh, something, but we've actually uh, taken up these experiments. This is the results of our experiment. We get a similar uh, result. We're trying to improve the yield. So um, it's possible in the future, sometime in the distant future, that this thing will be filled with solid, easy water and the information density may be uh, really huge. So I went off on a tangent um, because I like to. Uh, is easy water physically distinct from bulk water? Yes. Um, uh, the best we can surmise is a layered honeycomb structure and it has uh, tentatively some information storage capability. If anybody has interest, come to our conference. You'll see uh, presentations from scientists. Um, okay, so I mentioned to you that this was a battery uh, 
um, where the positives and negatives are separated. But as you know, um, you need energy to recharge a battery or to charge it. And we couldn't figure it out. Um, finally, a student figured it out. Uh, we didn't figure it out. He did an experiment that he wasn't supposed to do. I, I like when the students do that. Um, and um, we found that the energy comes from light. It's photon energy that charges uh, uh, the water battery. And the experiment that the student did looks like this. So you got a hydrophilic material. Um, uh, we used nafion, uh, a polymer, a common polymer that is like Teflon, but it has sulfonic acid groups. And here's the exclusion zone. And typically the exclusion zone boundary between exclusion zone and microsphere containing water is straight. It's parallel to this one. But this guy, the student grabbed a lamp that was sitting right next to him and shined it and he called me over. He said, here, take a look at this. And you can see the exclusion zone in the region that was illuminated. The exclusion zone um, is is expanded, and so of course I said to the student, "Well, you know, turn off the lamp, take it away, and see what happens." And sure enough, it was reversible in a time constant on the order of tens of minutes. It came right back to where it was originally. So it didn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that, uh, hey, you know, it looks like uh, energy from photons is responsible for building this um, um, this zone, and I. You know, I'm going to mention later photosynthesis, where light is playing a very big role, and I think the two are actually rather maybe closely related. So we did experiments, we published them. You know, uh, the most effective uh, wavelength uh, is infrared, especially about three micrometers, which is the wavelength that water absorbs uh, the most uh, infrared. And a lot of people are not so aware of infrared, what it is, we think, uh, you know, it's the toaster, you turn on the toaster, you get heat and infrared energy coming out. But in fact, it's all over. You uh, effectively can't get rid of it. Um, so if you turn off all the lights um, and turn on your camera that has an infrared sensor instead of an optical sensor, um, you get a beautiful image of anything uh, uh, around you because it's all generating infrared. And because this infrared is omnipresent, it means that whenever you have hydrophilic material next to water, you'll always have some easy water present. And if you add more infrared, um, then you get more easy water. And if you take away the extra, it goes back to the default condition. So it's always there. So in terms of energy for buildup, um, easy, Buildup is powered by photonic energy, by light, um, uh, which orders the water and charges the water battery. So it looks something like this. Um, um, you know, basically, you just lie on the beach um, and you get charged, uh, just as some of us might, might do when we're overloaded and we need some re recharging. But if you're thinking, and I know you're all thinking, you're thinking, well, gee, you know, if it's so simple, if you get charged just by sitting in sun, and you know, the sun is roughly half of it is infrared. Um, that's why it feels warm. Uh, you might expect that you ought to be able to harvest some of this energy, right, to, to do something. But I would guess that uh, not one of you has ever seen a glass of water doing work. Uh, maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think so. Uh, I'm going to demonstrate how a glass of water can do work. Um, um, uh, can the energy be harvested? And then all this started with another undergraduate student. And, um, and we had just uh, uh, found out that, that um, we could get nafion not only in sheets, but also in tubes. And so I asked the student to please take a look and see if, uh, despite the tubular shape, is there an exclusion zone just outside, just inside, uh, et cetera? He was a good student, so he figured out very quickly, the answer was yes, uh, there are exclusion zones. It doesn't matter that this is curved. And, um, and after a week or two, he comes, he comes bounding into my office. Usually the students are polite. You know, I'm, I'm pretty easy with, with students, but, but you know, they'll kind of crack open the door or knock on the door if it's closed, which is unusual. But this guy came barging in and I had a visitor. I don't remember how, who the visitor was or how important he was, but I had a visitor. And he comes barging in and he said, I have something important to tell you, something really interesting. 
okay, so what's interesting? He said, you know, I put, I put the little spheres in the water and I've got my microscope lens sitting at the bottom looking here and I see the water flowing through and it doesn't stop. And I thought, well, you know, if he's right, and we checked to see that he was right, if he's right, this is amazing because usually you need, you need energy to drive the flow, right? The water has viscosity to it. And, you know, typically you, you have a pressure gradient that drives the flow, but there's no pressure gradient here. It's just, um, you know, uh, this, this level, hydrostatic pressure here is the same as here, yet it just keeps flowing. So um, uh, I was thinking th this could be the proof that we were looking for that really the energy that's coming from the environment, infrared energy is what's propelling this. And so of course I, I got excited about it. And, um, uh, and, and so it looks, the experiment looks like this. You take um, a tube and you put some uh, water in, uh, inside, make sure there are no air bubbles. And then you immerse it in water plus microspheres. Right, you take it uh, to the microscope. We use green light just to reduce the amount of overall light and look into it. And this is what you find. Um, so here's Nafion tube, the exclusion zone. And this keeps going. And we've had it going for as much as a day and a half. And we know how to keep it going longer, but there was no particular reason to do it. Someone came and said, well, you know, we're not so sure of this because maybe Nafion has some weird properties that allow this to happen. Why don't you get some other tubes? We couldn't find other tubes, so we created our own. And and the tube, um, and the tube was was like this. We took a we took a, a gel just before it gelled. We stuck a, a, a needle, a wire in it, and as it was gelling, we pulled out the wire, and that gave us a tunnel as a gel, a little block of gel with a tunnel right, inside. And we took this block of gel with the tunnel, and we immersed it into water plus microspheres. Um, and, um, and so here's what it looks like. Here's a polyacrylic acid gel, gel material, gel material. And this is the tunnel and the tunnel was empty, but when we immersed it into the water and microspheres, um, the easy built up next to uh, the gel surface, next to the gel surface, and all of the microspheres were uh, pushed to the center. Um, and that's what we expected. And we look at it and um, same, same result. We've tried now eight different gels and we get the same result with all the gels, a different speed and such, but basically the same result. So another person, uh, we listened, <laughs> another person said, well, you think all of this is driven by light? Why don't you just turn up the microscope light and see if it goes faster? So we turned up the microscope light and we published this. Um, we got five times the speed increase um, uh, turning up the microscope light. So, um, Basically, we have a hollow tube, a hydrophilic material sitting in water, and work is done. Uh, so uh, in order to do work, energy is required. And therefore, um, the only energy that we could conceive of um, is the energy absorption that comes from light. Uh, if there's another one, I'd like to hear about it because we, we couldn't uh, imagine it. It's a necessary condition. So water transduces uh, light energy into mechanical energy. Uh, water is, is a, a, a transducer. And, and we have other, other examples. I don't have time to do it. Now, what about uh, human biology, humans? Do we, do we use radiant energy? Uh, well, if you were mother nature, um, and you know, I'm not sure that's what you look like, but uh, it could be. You know, you've been successful with plants and successful with unicellular organisms, and they all use light. Um, and you decided, um, you know, want to do something different. I, I think I'll create humans. And um, so you have two options. One is, well, humans can forage for their food. They don't need light. On the other hand, you know, light has been pretty successful. So why not keep it as an adjunct or um, complementary source of energy? And I think if you were mother nature, you might opt to do that, uh, to do that. And so if so, where, where would you do it? Or what, I mean, how, what way? So think of yourself, you're absorbing energy all the time. Some of the wavelengths penetrate actually rather deeply, others less deeply. And a, a first thought is the cardiovascular system. And I did my PhD uh, computer model of the cardiovascular system pressures and flows. And I must say, I thought we had it all worked out. Um, until I went to Russia. 
um, you know, we could we could deduce the pressures and flows. And I went to visit my friend Vladimir Vyakov at Moscow University, and he immediately introduced me to his colleague. And the colleague starts by saying, there's a big problem in the cardiovascular system. Okay, well, I'm ready to listen. I, you know, I, I, I was feeling pretty maybe arrogant at the time because uh, I thought I knew a lot about the cardiovascular system. But within five minutes, he had me convinced. So what's the problem? Well, the problem is this. Um, um, the problem is, this is uh, what you see here is some muscle tissue. You can see the striations. And here's a capillary and another capillary and another capillary. And the red blood cells are supposed to look like this. But they actually look like this when they go through. And the reason is that the red blood cells are something like twice the diameter of capillaries in healthy young adults. It looks like a mistake of mother nature, but we all know that mother nature doesn't make mistakes. So, but in order to go through um, the capillaries, they have to be squeezed and they calculated the amount of energy needed to squeeze them so that they can work their way through the capillaries. And their conclusion was that if the heart alone were responsible for driving the blood through the capillaries, the heart would need to develop something like 1 million times the pressure that it actually develops. It's high blood pressure. <laughs> uh, so obviously there's gotta be some source of energy beyond, besides the heart that, you know, that is, is doing this. Um, uh, and, you know, I frankly never thought about that, but uh, this guy's having a hard time getting through. Um, but you need energy to, to do that. And so where does the energy come from? Well, they had a few ideas and I'm thinking as the guy was talking, um, um, you know, we just did these experiments with hollow tubes and we found that light, radiant energy is, is actually the source of energy driving flow. Um, and uh, so I kind of asked myself before <laughs> immediately, might radiant energy help drive the blood flow um, through the capillaries in the cardiovascular system? And uh, we found, my student found a hint, and this comes from an Israeli scientist, and I, I'm sorry, I didn't, didn't, don't have his name. They were doing experiments with mice, open-chested mice, and I can't remember what they were testing, but um, after their experiment was finished, they clamped the aorta and the mouse uh, complied by dying um, within 10 seconds. But they noticed something peculiar. They noticed that the flow continued after the mouse was dead. Um, and it continued five minutes, 10 minutes, 30 minutes, more than one hour post postmortem, still there was flow. And my student uncovered a half dozen papers uh, published during the past century that showed the same. Each one a different situation, a, a different experiment. They all found the same, that even if you stop the heart, the flow continues. Uh, I, I think probably you were not aware of that, but um, so uh, we decided to do our own experiment um, and um, uh, we used a chick embryo, uh, three days old. And you can see the, the egg. Um, so um, after three days, the cardiovascular system is well developed, uh, although the regulatory systems are not yet developed, so it's rather pure. So he developed, a, um, we, he lopped off the top of the egg, developed a microscopic system to look at uh, these vessels to see what happens. Um, and so uh, here's uh, his result actually submitted today for publication. Um, um, so this is blood flow velocity versus time. So first, um, he stops the heart by using potassium chloride and the velocity goes down uh, quite a lot, but not zero, it just keeps going, you see. And then he tested to see whether the signature feature of our mechanism, the one I showed you in, in the lab, um, applies. And so he, he applied infrared energy. And as you can see, the, the flow increased by a factor of three times or so. And when when it removed, it went back down to, uh, to the baseline. So on, on the basis of this, we think that, um, first of all, there must be some other mechanism besides the heart that helps drive the flow. And we think, uh, we don't know for sure, but the, these, this experiment suggests to us that the same mechanism that we found in the laboratory um, 
uh, the, the um, incessant flow through the tube is applying um, in my heart and uh, or in my cardiovascular system and yours. In other words, the heart is not the only driver of the blood flow. The vessels themselves are driving the flow, just like we found in, in the laboratory. Um, so radiant energy um, does help uh, drive blood flow and the energy could come from outside, but also your metabolism is generating heat, infrared energy. And so it could come from there as well. And of course, uh, similar for, for plant flow where I already uh, showed you this, this slide. Um, so you've got a hollow tube in a vertical direction, for example, and, and, um, and we, we presume the same sort of flow should occur through here in, in the xylems. And uh, that can explain um, uh, uh, the seasonal flow that exists. And, and so for example, springtime and summer, uh, you've got infrared energy that's very much pleasant, very present and driving uh, seasonal flow in the vessels in, inside. And of course it keeps the leaves green, but come the fall, maybe not in Israel, but um, in most other places, um, it gets cooler. There's less IR, there's less IR the water flow stops. The plant becomes dehydrated and then you have these beautiful colors uh, appearing. So um, from all of this, I'm not suggesting that, uh, that uh, we photosynthesize, um, you know, but light is the first step in photosynthesis. It's 100% um, uh, efficient from uh, what I've heard. And, and I'm suggesting to you that we may use light in a way that's similar to the first step in, in photosynthesis. Um, so um, now how exactly does radiant energy facilitate uh, function in, in plant cells or animal cells? Well, you, you know, in, in, in green algae, uh, first step again is photo, in photosynthesis is uh, splitting of water. In bacteria, some single cell bacteria do the same. I love this slide. <laughs> And of course, in green plants, you folks know more about them than I do. You know, it rains, uh, the roots take up the water. Um, uh, we have the light shining on, on, on the leaves. And, and step one is the water is broken into positive and negative, just like pretty much what I've, what I've shown you, I see. And so the situation is looking like this. You've got some material and you've got um, here, the fourth phase or easy water I right hear and the protons uh, sitting out here. And this is potential energy that can be uh, released uh, inside of a cell. So, so if you look at a cell to try to figure out you know, what's going on and how does this work, you've got the cell membrane here and you've got inside, you've got the solids. And as I mentioned, around each solid is going to be easy water with its negative charge. Um, and the cell is so crowded, this is grossly underestimates, uh, that it's just solidly packed with easy water, uh, uh, negatively charged. Now, you know, negative charges repel. So this is potential energy that's sit, sitting inside the cell, um, potential energy. And this potential energy, as I described in my 2001 book, is driving protein folding, right? Which is basically the work of the cell. So you've got the energy driving the work. And the way uh, in, in, in some de detail, the way this works is, is shown here. So, so you've got um, a protein which wants to do work and it does the work by folding and it's surrounded by easy water. And so what happens is the first thing is that the water melts into ordinary water, a phase transition, and the protein can do its thing. And then it wants to restore to its initial condition um, when the cell is not activated to do what it's designed to do, like a muscle cell stops contracting and it goes back to the initial condition and the easy water builds up. Now, if you don't have easy water in your cell or you don't have as much easy water, then, um, then the protein becomes impotent. It can't do what it's planning to do. And your, your muscle might be in a permanently uh, contracted position. So, so you need easy water in, in your cell. You need a full complement of easy water to function. Uh, and that goes for plants and it goes for animals. Um, and this potential energy uh, coming from here is what uh, drives the work of the cell. So you can, you can uh, see the, the sequence. So remember, light builds EZ. EZ has negative charge. That gives you potential energy. 
uh, and the energy drives the work or folding. And connecting the dots, it's light uh, that's responsible, or uh, at least in part, for the work folding uh, of the proteins. Um, light plays some role. I'm not suggesting it's it's the, the full role, but it plays some role. So if you ask the question, where do we get our energy? Well, obviously, uh, <clears throat> we get our energy from uh, from food. But we also get our energy from light following that pathway. And um, the light is absorbed, especially infrared, is absorbed by the water, builds EZ, gives us energy. Uh, should this matter to you? Um, well, um, yeah, because light matters and water matters. And so what you might want to ask for yourself is what builds easy water inside your cells? Because that's what you need to keep you healthy. Um, well, the first is water, obviously. You know, it's the raw material, so you got to drink a lot. And uh, most of us, most of us uh, who are long in the tooth are dehydrated. And we need to drink a lot. Green juicing. Uh, <coughs> I think some of you know about that. You take plant cells um, or you take plants, uh, leaves and uh, scrunch them down, squeeze out the water. Well, what is the water? It's the water inside the plant cells and it contains lots of easy, fresh, uh, beautiful, uh, um, and you drink it. Um, uh, you add some flavoring to make it tolerable. Uh, you drink it and uh, the reports I get from uh, many healthcare practitioners is no matter what the patient walks in with, they're suggested that they do green, green juicing and they invariably get better. They also lose weight. <laughs> uh, there are certain substances, uh, turmeric, coconut water, basil is another, uh, ghee, that have been known since Ayurvedic times to be good for health. And many of these uh, are good for almost whatever bothers you. And we were thinking, uh, well, maybe these build easy water. And so we tested it um, in the same chamber that I, I showed you and published it. And indeed, every one of them expands easy water, grows easy water. So we think that the reason all of these are so good for health is because in the concentrations that are common, um, if we, in, in, if we uh, swallow some of this stuff, concentrations in our body, they build easy. In Seattle, where I live, in the wintertime, we don't get much sunshine. And um, you go out one day and suddenly the sun is peeking through the clouds. Um, you feel good. And, and the usual um, interpretation is that uh, it's a psychological effect and it might, it might well be. However, uh, remember the sun contains uh, a lot of infrared. You absorb that in your, and some of it penetrates your skull. Um, goes into your brain, uh, builds easy, and you uh, return to the default state uh, where you're not depressed, you're feeling good. Um, and I, I think this is part of the explanation. Um, the same with a sauna. Um, you know, I have lots of, well, some experience in, in Finland and Russia. It really works. And, um, and what is a sauna? Well, you know, it's heat and heat is essentially the same as uh, in infrared energy and infrared builds easy. So you go into the sauna feeling tired and depressed and full of aches and pains and you, you come out feeling better. And possible explanation is exactly that. Uh, the infrared energy builds easy water. You need easy water to function properly and it works. And finally, um, grounding. Um, or earthing. Um, so why, why does that work? And it, it does seem to work. There's a whole literature on this right now. Just connect yourself to the earth electrically and you feel better. You can sleep better. You're uh, not depressed. You're um, full of energy, et cetera, et cetera. And the reason, and this was new to me, I, <laughs> I didn't realize I had my initial schooling in electrical engineering and no professor ever told me that that the earth was, has a net negative charge. Uh, and I still didn't believe it when my Russian colleague told me that you know, every Russian middle school student knows it. And in this country, nobody knows it. Uh, it's been forgotten, but the evidence is just as good as it was 50, 60 years ago. And one of my students uh, brought me Feynman's lectures, um, volume two, chapter nine. Um, it's all about the negative charge of the earth.
So what are you doing? Uh, when you connect yourself electrically to this vast supply of negative charge, um, uh, uh, the negative charge is, is then able, able to run into your body into any, any area or region that is insufficiently negative, negatively charged. And we found through published experiments that um, if we add negative charge to water, it builds EZ water. So I think the reason this works is you connect yourself to the negative earth, it helps build EZ water. So those are simple expedients to feel well. I end with practical applications. Um, now, the first one is um, everybody likes practical applications. Getting energy from water and sunlight. Um, so this is familiar to you by now. You stick two electrodes in, and um, if this is correct, you ought to be able to light a light bulb. Um, and uh, here's a laboratory apparatus that does just that. These are little cells. Each one contains water, a nafion, two electrodes, one in negative, one in positive. This is a switch, a magnifier, and an LED just behind it. And, um, and so um, turn it on, and there you go, it works. This is energy, uh, completely renewable energy from uh, water and light. Of course, we're uh, trying to work on this to develop it, but as you know, um, it's not so simple to go from laboratory to, um, to um, uh, uh, generally useful. Another one that we're working on is getting drinking water from contaminated water. And um, uh, this by now, I hope should be familiar. You have flow that's coming in and the water that's coming in may contain all kinds of junk, uh, hazari. <laughs> and uh, so it, it comes in and um, with pharmaceuticals or whatever and quickly gets separated. You have an exclusion zone here and an exclusion zone here. And typically for trial runs, we use microspheres instead of bacteria or pharmaceuticals, but we've done a lot of experiments with these too. So we built a device called the differential extractor, which is a fancy name for two concentric tubes. And this one takes uh, the concentrated junk and dumps it. Um, and then um, this outer uh, um, uh, cylinder, um, is the dilute one, where, which should have very little. And you can see that here. And we've been able to, um, this is not our best result, but uh, we've been able to get in one single run a, a separation of as much as 200 to one. So we're excited about this and we've been working on it, but uh, you know, <laughs> there, there are um, a lot of technical issues that need to be overcome. Our dream is, um, is, um, um, is this one. Uh, salt, to get rid of the salt in the water. We know that the exclusion zone excludes salts, uh, common salts. So the idea is to put ocean water in and um, um, separate the salt, uh, dump the salt, and get not only drinking water, but drinking water that's probably rich and easy and is good, good for your health. This is a real challenge. It's not easy to do this, but it's on our list. And you know, when you've got a lot of sun, there's no physical filter here. You don't need a physical filter to change or uh, clean or whatever. Uh, it just keeps working, at least in theory. And the energy to run this is, this is um, not like usual desalination because the energy comes from the sun. Um, and where you guys live, you got plenty of sun. So, so we're excited about this too. So uh, I conclude the main point that I, tried to share with you is that uh, our evidence suggests that the water has not three phases that we all know about, but a fourth phase called EZ phase. And I put it here between the ice and the water because we've done experiments to demonstrate that if you wanna freeze water to go from here to here, you cannot go from here to here. You must go uh, through this intermediate phase. And, and you know, I, I've shown you that this, this structure is actually not so different from the ice structure. It's different, but, but there are a lot of similarities. And so, so if you wanna freeze water, you go through this intermediate stage then here. And if you wanna melt the ice, it's exactly the same. And um, again, we have evidence that um, we've published to show that, that this is the case. So um, all of this has broad implications. I think the main or central point is that is that the water is, is uh, absorbing radiant energy from the environment or from uh, 
anywhere it comes from and uses this in many ways. It just it doesn't re-radiate, but some of it gets re-radiated, but some of it is used. And I've given you an example of, uh, or a few examples in biology, especially in blood flow, um, where radiant energy is used to propel the blood. Uh, in terms of chemistry, if what I presented to you is correct or partly correct, a lot of interpretations uh, of uh, uh, basic fundamental chemistry may need to be changed because whenever you deal with a, a aqueous a re, a reaction occurring in aqueous solution, nobody is dealing with the separation of charge, nobody is dealing with the absorption of of energy, um, nobody's dealing with easy, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, you know, hopefully some other reactions will be simpler to interpret, not more difficult to interpret. Uh, whether, um, well, in Seattle, uh, we care about it maybe even more, more than you do because we get up, we want to know whether we have to take an umbrella to work or not. 50% chance that doesn't help us a whole lot. We know that clouds are full of electricity. Um, it's not just in lightning storms, but evidence from 50, 60 years ago uh, has shown that the clouds are full of negative charge. By the way, negative charge repelling the Earth's negative charge is, I believe, why the clouds stay up. Um, the question I asked er early on. So I think that the weather forecasts um, or weather interpretation anyway, will improve when people begin taking into account that the clouds are actually charged. Um, um, and right now I've never seen a weather forecast where the word charge is, is, is mentioned. So that I think is gonna change. Uh, for health, I presented to you how easy water is absolutely central for, um, for our health and well-being. For food, if you want to, um, uh, preserve it by dehydration or freezing. It's nice to know something about how that works. Uh, from practical point of view, I talked about filtration briefly and desalination um, and also getting electricity from water and, and light. So um, I'd like to show next to the last slide. Um, this is not directly related to what I presented, but we have an institute that we put together. It's called the Institute for Venture Science and it funds promising ideas that, uh, that challenge existing ideas that you know, have reached a dead end and therefore may bring scientific revolutions of which we have, many tech, we have many technological revolutions allowing me, for example, to make this presentation, but not so many uh, um, scientific revolutions of the same magnitude as, uh, for example, the structure of DNA or splitting of the atom. And we've uh, already identified five uh, promising projects that if, if validated will shake the earth. And we're looking of course for people who have done well and who would like to see something like this happen, who believe in, in, in new and revolutionary science. And finally, um, uh, a lot of what I've presented to you uh, appears in, in, in this book. Um, uh, the fourth phase of water, which has actually become rather rather popular, and um, and I would recommend to you to have a look if you if if you wish. Um, what I've omitted from this talk is explained in great detail uh, in in this book. So I quit here. Thank you very much. I think I've gone over time a little bit. I apologize. Thank you. Thank you for your talk, Jerry. If anyone has any questions, please go ahead. I have a question. Okay. Um, thanks. Uh, it was a really interesting talk. Well, thank you. Um, um, oh, I, I have a couple of questions. The first one is regarding the directionality. I mean, you showed in the tubes that uh, there is a flow to a certain direction. And if you have any idea how the direction is determined? Well, I have some idea, but nothing conclusive. So of course we, we wondered ourselves. Um, and, and uh, you know, it turns out that uh, I didn't mention, but 10, 15% of cases we get no flow at all. And our interpretation is we don't see flow because everything is too symmetrical. You have to have some asymmetry to drive the flow. Um, and, um, and so, 
we, we started by uh, taking tubes, tapered tubes. We were able to create a taper in the tube. And we were happy to find out that it always exited the smaller end. But then another student <laughs> took a different material and also created a taper and it all went the other end. <laughs> so so uh, that didn't, didn't help us. Uh, um, um, and um, when you think about the tube that you, you have sitting there, um, the tube is uh, theoretically, it's symmetrical, uh, but it's not really a cylinder because first of all, you cut the tube from a long um, uh, piece of tubing. And when you cut it, the ends are not exactly um, uh, 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 smooth, you know, little, little ridges and little pieces extending beyond. But more than that, asymmetry that you're gonna get from that is the asymmetry of light. So you're doing an experiment and a nearer window and the light is coming from the window, you see, and all of those kinds of asymmetry should be sufficient to start the flow. And once it starts, see, it's immersed in water. So if flow comes out one end, it's gonna come in the other end and then the process is perpetuated. So I'm sorry, I can't give you a definitive answer to, uh, to that question. We've tried and, um, um, and all we can say at the moment is, is that it requires some kind of asymmetry in order to drive it. Okay. Okay, thanks. The second question relates to what you showed inside cells. You, you suggest that because it is so packed, uh, the entire content of the cell is supposedly easy, wa easy water. Yes. Um, so uh, in that case, I don't know if you, I mean, how much deep you went into cell biology, but there are uh, cases where the, you have phase separation uh, kind of, of, of aggregates of proteins and other macromolecules that are, that are studies and people claim that they are uh, uh, separated not by a membrane, uh, either by, uh, rather by a, a phase separation that distinguishes them from the other liquid because of the high density of the proteins. So. Uh, do you have any uh, idea regarding this uh, phase separation thing inside cells? Well, I, I haven't, you know, I haven't heard it discussed as uh, phase separation, uh, but, um, um, but I think we're talking about the same thing, aren't we? Uh, I mean, um, 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 the, the uh, phase separation could be a result of, of, of the easy water. You know, I don't claim that every bit of water in the cell is, is easy water because um, you know, when the easy water is created, uh, it also gives rise to protons, but the protons um, uh, are excluded from, uh, from, from the cell and ultimately excluded from our body because uh, every, time, every time you exhale, um, you're breathing out CO2 and water vapor and together that's you know, carbonic acid. Um, um, and you get rid of protons that way. And also when you sweat, um, usually the pH of the sweat is, is um, um, low pH and um, Alex, hi, uh, um, is low pH and therefore um, uh, you get rid of protons that way. And so the cell remains with its uh, uh, negative charge, easy water. Um, uh, um, that hasn't exactly answered your question. I, I, I'm sorry. And um, uh, but but I, I can certainly imagine that phase separation that you're talking about. I, uh, I haven't followed that story exactly. Um, uh, it, it somehow can easily involve easy water. Um, I'll leave it at that. Yeah. Thank you. Shmule. Thank you, Gerald, uh, for, the for the lecture. Also for giving up some of your overnight sleep. <laughs> Actually, the first question I wanted to ask uh, was asked already by Simon, but before getting to it, first I want to make sure. We are the Institute of Soil and Water, and soil particles are usually hydrophilic, but yeah. we don't have any light penetrating into the soil, neither uh, no, uh, not infrared, neither other components. So we don't have uh, this easy water in soil, right? Well, I'm not sure. Um, um, uh, uh, Good question. Um, um, I, I again, I, I I'm deviating from answering your question exactly. Exactly, but I, the reason I'm deviating is I know several examples where where people have have done uh, agricultural experiments uh, using water that contains EZ, and the water that contains EZ 
um, uh, the the uh, the yield is is substantially greater than than uh, the water that uh, doesn't contain EZ. I can't cite published papers, but I've heard this now from uh, several individuals who have tried it. So, so a good question. Uh, <clears throat> um, rain rain that gets in, and so um, I think that rain uh, may actually contain uh, EZ. Uh, I know that people dealing with agriculture claim that um, that uh, rainwater is superior to uh, other kinds of uh, like irrigation water, and in in the book uh, you see in front of me I describe the evidence that a raindrop is actually uh, it consists of um, uh, water with an easy shell, um, and and the easy shell is what basically gives the rain raindrop uh, its its shape, and so. So that does penetrate, and so you know, in in some ways, the easy um, maybe does penetrate down uh, reasonably far in um, in in soil, uh, and this could be the reason why uh, why rain is actually maybe more effective than irrigation water, and similarly, if you take irrigation water and if you do something to create easy, it uh, it it may indeed improve the yield. Yeah, I can tell you that we have uh, some uh, indirect evidence. I don't know what, uh, whether you have a notion on the dielectric permittivity of uh, this uh, fourth phase, uh, static permittivity relaxation time. But what, when we do model the effective dielectric constant of the soil, either static or megahertz or gigahertz range, it resembles very much uh, that of uh, bulk water. So we don't have a, in this term, we use it just for measuring uh, volumetric water content. And it looks like most of the big majority of water are uh, bulk water, neither ice or no this uh, fall rate. But I want yeah, to come uh, back to this hollow tube. Come uh, back to, to what, sorry? Yeah, to the hollow uh, Nafion tube. Okay. And, and the flow. Yeah. Nothing to do with uh, whether it's a uh, left road or right road. Uh, I, I, I missed what's the, what is the mechanism driving the flow? And second, the experimental issue, how did you make sure there's no just convection caused by uh, temperature differences and uh, density differences in your box? Oh, uh, we, we checked that carefully about uh, temperature differences and that's in the publication. Uh, uh, and the mechanism, I'm sorry, I, I didn't, uh, show a couple of slides about the mechanism because I wanted to save time, but the mechanism is not complicated. So uh, inside um, uh, you have a Nafion tube. This is, we're looking at the cross section now. Uh, inside you have an annular EZ that runs here and the protons are um, uh, in the core, right in the core, separated from the EZ. You with me so far? Uh, yes. Yeah, okay. And, and those protons are free, they, they repel each other. And because they repel each other, they wanna get out of the tube. So they will go either this way or this way or, or some of each. Uh, and um, so those free protons are then leaving the tube. And we actually measure that the protons are leaving the tube. Uh, we, can, we, we can track that and measure it using pH sensitive dye. So once, they, uh, once the water starts, uh, the protonated water starts going in this direction, more water is coming in from the other side to, to fill the space. And then the process is perpetuated. That's how we think it works. Does that make sense to you? <laughs> yes, yes. Okay, thank you. Can I, can I ask another one? You can ask as many as you want. Yeah, but the other people, who is running here? Shaha. <laughs> okay, I, I asked the, the last one. You said you could uh, measure a potential difference of 100 uh, microvolts, right? Millivolts. I mean, uh, millivolts, okay. So, so uh, what's, uh, what stops the electrical current, the charge from uh, flowing? Why is there no cup coupling and uh, flow? What gives this potential? Well, the potential is created by the separation of charge. So, um, uh, I, I tried to describe the mechanism by, by which the EZ builds and, and casts out the protons into the region beyond the EZ. So EZ is negative, and then you got positives uh, right uh, uh, beyond, beyond that. And um, um, 
so so I mean that that's the key that they don't they don't recombine they stay separated and the energy for doing that is coming from light uh, to maintain that separation. Uh, so so you 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 have that uh, a separation and then you basically stick two very fine electrodes uh, invented by the way by the same Gilbert Ling who influenced me uh, stick the electrodes one one in the easy and one beyond the easy. And the easy, it's not a uniform electrical potential as I intimated, it actually, um, it actually builds as you get closer to the hydrophilic surface, it becomes more negative. And typically right next to the hydrophilic surface, it's minus 200 millivolts. It's a big potential difference. It's not so different from what you find in plant cells. Uh, uh, animal cells oh, usually are- we, we have a diffuse double layer, but uh, because of another or, uh, origin. Because yeah, yeah, but- large, uh, Surfaces. Okay. The, the double layer is, uh, you know, we're talking about a few nanometers, but here we're talking about uh, many micrometers, even millimeter size. Um, we, we have EZs that extend for uh, next to ghee, for example, uh, you know, clarified butter. Uh, typically, it's very close to one millimeter exclusion zone, which is like a million uh, or so molecular layers. So a lot. Yeah. Thank you. Sure, thank you for your questions. I like them. <laughs> Gary, can I ask, uh, did you measure the conversion efficiency of the energy in your experiments? So you shine- No. Uh, no. No, we never estimate? done that. Is it- No, I wish I did, but uh, there's so many uncertainties. Uh, um, you know, sometimes uh, in my experience, quantification, you can get any result you want by making the right assumptions. <laughs> and. Uh, and we, we, we just never bothered to do that. I guess we should, uh, but we haven't done it. Sorry. You know, in Seattle, the day also has 24 hours, um, just like in Israel. <laughs> There's so much, just so much you can do. Um, but you are very efficient in using all these uh, 24 hours. In so. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I'm not accustomed to, um, to uh, 2 a.m. lectures and, uh, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm surprised that I can actually answer a few questions <laughs> at this hour. But... Uh, can, can I ask a question? Shafra? Please, Guy. No. Uh, first, thank you very much for the very interesting uh, talk. Now, I, I want to ask, in your slides, you showed the easy water layer next to the hydrophilic uh, solid phase, but the, and then you showed bulk water, but <coughs> if I understand <coughs> correctly physics, then electron neutrality must be retained. So next to the easy water should be another layer of uh, protons, right? To compensate for the- Well, yeah, but the pro yeah, of so- the negative charge. So did you look at the properties of this concentrated proton layer and whether that affected the various- um, I'm not sure what you mean by the properties of it, but uh, we, I think uh, well, we, we maintain yeah. electroneutrality because the EZ is negative and the region beyond is positive uh, caused by water splitting. Uh, so maybe I'm not understanding your question. No, so no, I, I would, maybe what I'm trying to get it is whether this con uh, layer of protons has also an effect on the various properties phenomena that you were looking at. Oh yeah, well, it, it should, uh, absolutely. Um, uh, um, well, um, yeah, our focus is mainly on the EZ rather than the protons, but of course the protons have, have uh, uh, an impact. One, one impact is, is friction um, or lack of friction. So, you know, in Israel, there are not too many ice skating rinks, I think, but um, um, in, in Scandinavia, for example, You've got a lot of them. And a friend of mine builds uh, uh, Olympic ice skating rinks and we talk about the surface of the ice. And so there's a liquid layer on the surface, a fine liquid layer. And, uh, and he thinks, I think too, there's easy on the surface uh, next to the ice and then protons. You take protons and you try to squeeze them together and they resist, right? Because you know they don't wanna be squeezed together. And that is the reason uh, I think, he thinks too, why there's low friction, why you can ice skate with almost no friction because you're squeezing, um, you're squeezing the, this proton uh, layer. Um, 
and 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 this phenomenon exists in, in many manifestations. Um, uh, you, you've you've got um, um, many protons. And you try to squeeze them, and they they won't they won't allow you to to squeeze. And your joints are, are just like that. For example, the joints between the bones. Um, so you have two cartilaginous uh, uh, layers. And in between, you've got um, uh, um, some liquid that contains many, many protons. And you try to squeeze your two bones together. You know, when you, when you jump, you can't, the bones will never touch. And the reason they'll never touch is all those protons. And the protons come, I think, from the buildup of EZ um, uh, into and next to the cartilage, because the cartilage has just the kind of structure that you'd expect to build uh, EZ. So those are, you know, a couple of examples of, of um, why the protons are just as important as the as the EZ. Only I haven't focused on them. And also in the tube, uh, we talked about the protons in the core of the tube uh, trying to work their way out. And by the way, um, I'm not so sure about the principle of electroneutrality. I know that this is commonly accepted, but for example, the Earth. Um, the Earth maintains a um, uh, net negative charge. It's not neutral. How is that possible? And I think the reason it's possible is that energy is coming in all the time uh, uh, to create this separation of charge. And, and so, um, and there's always that energy that's coming in. So you can't get rid of it because the infrared energy is, is all around us. So, so the principle of electron neutrality may be a um, you know, convenient um, artifice for chemists to think about, but I'm not sure it's always true. Maybe the atmospheric is a positive, no? I'm sorry, maybe what? Maybe the atmospheric atmosphere is positive. It is. It's well known. It's positive. Okay. So, yeah, so yeah. The, the earth is neutral, not the solid earth. <laughs> well, okay. Yeah, you can say that. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah, there's an electric field that uh, runs from, well, you know about this, okay. Yeah. Okay, maybe last question before we let Jerry go to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Jerry? <laughs> yeah? Can I ask a question? I was uh, also wondering. Yeah, sure. I, I I was also wondering about the direction of the flow in the hollow uh, tube. And I was wondering whether you tried the uh, different angles to put the tube in different angles, whether that uh, changed uh, the, the flow. Yeah, we did, we, we, we did that. Um, so once the flow is going, we took a tube um, where let's say the flow is going in this direction. And as it was going in this direction, we slowly rotated the tube and it maintained the direction with respect to the tube. Uh, I don't know what that means, but uh, you ah. know, we 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 tried a few experiments, and um, but uh, well, uh, I I guess that that's really all that I I have to say in response to it. I'm sorry, it's a short answer to the last question, uh, but uh, that's what we did. We haven't done very much more. Uh, you know, we went on to other things. Uh, for us, the excitement came when we, we realized that, um, you know, in your cardiovascular system, uh, it looks like it's not just the heart that drives it, but also the vessels. And um, uh, for us, this is exciting. And we've been spending a lot of time uh, dealing with that. Um, so, yeah. Did you so mention I, the Israeli yeah. experiment with the mites? What about the Israeli experiment? I'm sorry? I'm asking if you mentioned the Israeli experiment with the blood vessel continuing to flow in dead mice for an hour. Yes, yeah, yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? Uh, and uh, um, I, I think you joined late, Alex, but, uh, uh, but early on I, I mentioned that uh, I thought there were a half dozen papers over the last um, um, century, but actually my student who did the experiment was just at my house uh, this afternoon helping to pack up my stuff because I, as you know, I have to get rid of all, all the junk in my house to remediate from the mold. So he was here helping and he told me, no, actually it's actually, it, it's more like a dozen um, of papers published over the last 200 years that demonstrated the same thing, that when the heart stops, the flow continues. It's amazing. I mean, sometimes I can't sleep at night thinking about this because it's, uh, 
it's so incredible and, and people don't know about this. And so there's gotta be an explanation. You know, I mean, uh, if the heart stops, but the flow continues, it's very simple logic that something must be driving the flow besides the heart. And um, so this, this for me is very exciting. Um, it's exciting indeed. And, and Jerry, thank you very much for making the effort to give this. Oh, talk. My, my, my pleasure. Okay, so thank you guys for letting me uh, go to sleep now that I'm all wound up with these questions. <laughs> uh, you're a great audience. Okay, take care. Thank you. Good night. Thank you very thank much. You. Good night. Good night. Good, night. Good afternoon to you. Take care. Bye.